Doctor Who Season by Season. New Who Series 7A Review. Series 7 of the televised fan fiction New Who Series was broadcast in 2012, and then took a break while Stephen Moffat had a little nap, and finished broadcasting in 2013, the year which also included the 50th anniversary and the Christmas special that was the swan song of Matt Smith's 11th Doctor whose third and sort of fourth and final season this was. Oh bollocks! I am not looking forward to this one, folks. People offended by bad language had better fuck off right now, because there might be rather a lot in while I'm reviewing this one. Before series 7 however was the 2011 Christmas special, otherwise known as the wanker, the widow and the wardrobe. By this stage the Christmas specials were pretty much known for being absolutely awful, and A Christmas Carol the year before had buried any hopes that that might change under Stephen Moffat in a shallow grave somewhere. Few people could quite have prepared themselves for how bad this one was. A Christmas Carol at least had some semblance of a science fiction story, if not a very good one, a very boringly delivered one, and one that massively contradicted pretty much everything previously said about time travel in the entire history of the series. This however doesn't even have that. Not only is it as boring as all fuck, but oh my god it's twee and nauseating and stupid as well. Matt Smith has by this time changed from a great doctor in series 5 into a total tit you just want to get your hands on just so you can throttle him in order to get him to shut the fuck up for two seconds already. It has no story, no point, and it's as entertaining as the rest of Christmas day spent with relatives you'd really rather never see again for the rest of your natural. Gobsmackingly bad. Sadly that sentiment pretty much summed up the entire season that would follow. Series 7A, as it was known, was broadcast in late 2012 and ran for an epic total of, uh, five episodes. Wow, even by late 80s standards that's just plain taking the piss. It kicks off with Asylum of the Daleks. Given its immediate predecessor, Victory of the Daleks, was not only the absolute lowlight of series 5 but also one of the worst Dalek stories ever made, it shouldn't really have taken much to have this be better. Is it? Uh, not really. On first viewing I thought this was average at best, and I didn't immediately loathe it like I did almost everything else this season, but with every reviewing it just gets worse and worse because every watch just exposes how incredibly stupid and pointless it all is. Many in fandom have already soundly mocked the entire rationale for the Daleks having an asylum in the first place, and quite rightly as it makes no sense whatsoever and contradicts everything we've ever known all about them, as pretty much does the idea of them having a parliament. I mean, what the fuck? Do they have votes and everything? Can parliament members be exterminated if they get enough suckers held in the air? How does this work? I've no clue. I suspect Stephen Moff doesn't either. Brushing all that aside, though, what happens in the rest of the story is pretty suspect too. First off, this bizarre idea of nanogens turning everyone, including the dead, into Dalek slaves is again just stupid and contradictory and nonsensical. I mean, why do they even bother invading anywhere if they've got this shit? Just drop a few canisters of nanogens and Bob's your uncle. It's also a silly idea as the Dalek eye stalks literally growing out people's heads has the effect, as it did with Lytton wearing a Dalek helmet in Resurrection, of making these zombie monsters look like literal dickheads. It's also random and thrown in the haphazardly, presumably with the rationale that if you throw enough shit at the wall, some of it might stick. Unfortunately, in this case, the shit all stuck. On the audience. Christ and I haven't mentioned the entire ridiculous Amy and Rory divorce subplot, which is so what the fuck there are no words. It comes out of nowhere, has zero real rationale or motivation behind it, and is then resolved ridiculously easily and never mentioned again. So Amy can't have any more kids, but rather than, you know, 
look into surrogacy or adoption or something like most people might in that situation, she decides to act like a psycho bitch and make Rory miserable as fuck because it's best for him. Right. Makes total sense. Karen Gillan and Arthur Darville again do their best to lift the material, but even these guys can't turn shit into gold. The other big deal of Asylum of course is the fake-out introduction of Jenna Louise Coleman as Oswin, who turns out not to be the new companion when she turns out to be a Dalek having a very long and protracted nervous breakdown and then dies at the end. Um, okay. Whatever. The next story is Dinosaurs on a Spaceship, written by Chris Chibnall, who will take over as showrunner for Series 11 in 2018. Based on this effort, I'm not exactly holding my breath for the Chibs era. This episode actually seems quite popular and gets lots of its great fun from many fans, even some who are otherwise critical of the season and era, and I am buggered if I can figure out why, frankly. From the very first scene of the ridiculously unbelievable female historical character sexually harassing the doctor, in a way we are presumably supposed to find hilarious but which would result in a lengthy prison sentence and a permanent placement on the sex offenders registry if only the genders were reversed, this episode was shit on a stick. I say, female historical character, but the only way we're supposed to know this is her name and her silly costume because otherwise she acts more like some crazy binge you might mean down a nightclub in West Gloucestershire than an Egyptian queen or whatever the fuck she's supposed to be. Chibnall has the doctor assemble a team of disparate people from history to deal with this problem, for no apparent reason other than Chibber saw Moffat do it in a good man goes to war and thought it was cool. News flash Chris, nobody else did. There's the vaguest hint of a coherent plot in here but it's buried under so much to awfulness and loud shrieking it's difficult to ascertain. David Bradley is actually pretty good as the villain, and essays some genuinely sadistic menace, which makes it all the more shameful that he's wasted in a piece of garbage like this. Oh and there was some controversy among the more sanity challenged New Who fan brigade because the doctor lets Solomon die at the end rather than save mass murderer from being hoist by his own petard. Why are these people watching a sci-fi adventure show again? I think Dr. Phil would be more their bag than Dr. Who. The next story is A Town Called Mercy. The pre-publicity for this story had Moffat and Toby Withhouse and company noting that this is the second time Who has done a western and made vaguely disparaging noises about the William Hartnell story The Gunfighters, which is, needless to say, miles better than this scrap. Yes, sadly, a town called Mercy, or as I like to call it, a town called Mediocrity, is another astonishingly awful episode. It looks great, but that's about the only way this shockingly dull yawner scores over the gunfighters. Interestingly this is awful in a completely different way than morons on a spaceship. That was all loud and shrieking and CGI overload ahoy. This is quiet, reflective and duller than watching paint dry. There's some hilariously nonsensical moments like the doctor seemingly turning into a complete psycho in one scene for no apparent reason whatsoever, and Amy and Rory might as well be extras for all they have to do here. This is what you brought them back for another half season for Moft what? Really? Oh and the episode even tries to give us a lecture on morality which is exactly what I want from Doctor Who, particularly when it's good old as deep as your average puddle new Who. Thanks but no thanks. The next story is The Power of Three, or as I like to call it, The Power of Twi. This is another from Chris Chibnall, and the good news is it's not quite as I'd rather slit my own throat than sit through it again dire as morons on a spaceship. That still doesn't mean it's any good, of course. The alien plot is laughably plot and the wrap up so insultingly stupid it really does seem at this point that who has descended into the realm of kids TV, and not good kids TV either. Of course the excuse given by new who fans for this is that this episode is not about the story, it's a character episode. Well it's just a shame there's not much in the way of good writing there, then, either, isn't it? 
To be fair I did actually quite like the scene where the doctor tells Amy why he keeps going back to her, which was actually rather touching and well played by Smithy and Karen. Aside from that, though, forget it. The episode also is sadly remembered for introducing one of the beneficiaries of the Tree Preservation Society, in the form of Kate Lethbridge Stewart, who is spectacularly uninteresting, dull and has about as much charisma and presence as one of said trees, and is just as wooden. Why this character has returned several times since this introduction is something of a mystery to me, as she has no appeal whatsoever. Of course, she's liked solely because she's supposed to be the brigadier's daughter. She certainly didn't inherit her dad's warmth and charm, that's for certain. Strangely, the fact that she's called Kate is presumably meant to be a tie into the mid-90s video drama Downtime, which featured Nicholas Courtney as the brigadier and his daughter Kate, then played by Beverly Cressman, who to be frank was way more likable interesting and charismatic than this version. The final story of this abridged half season is The Angels Take Manhattan, with the return of the Angels, whose first two stories were both classics, and Amy and Rory set to leave. What could go wrong? Well, quite a lot, unfortunately. This is probably the best episode of this half season, if not the season as a whole, but it's about the worst best episode you can imagine. The regulars are excellent, and make this episode more sad and touching and memorable than it should be, because the script is an absolute fucking mess. The angels are really badly done here and for some reason the scariest monsters so far created for new who just don't seem all that scary here. The idea behind the building battery farm is intriguing yet poorly developed, with little explanation as to how all these people don't starve to death for one thing. Worse. The manner of Amy and Rory's departure is nonsensical. They're sent back in time and for some reason the doctor can't just go back and get them because, uh, he read it in a book and that can't be changed. X fucking excuse me? This coming from an era of the show that has ripped the rules of time travel up and played alphabetty spaghetti with them more than any other. Time can be rewritten. We have been explicitly told. Fuck. The Doctor changing his own death caused reality to implode just six episodes earlier, and he still got away with it in the end. But he read Amy and Rory's fate in a fucking book, ergo it can't be changed. What? There. Fuck. Of course Moffat, seemingly aware that he's full of shit on this score, then has some nonsense about the TARDIS being unable to go back to New York in that year because of some time disturbance scrap. Okay, so why doesn't he go to Los Angeles and then catch a fucking bus? He's supposed to be a super intelligent time lord, yet he can't figure out the answer to a fucking dilemma that I'm willing to bet your average five-year-old watching the show could. Holy shit. I haven't even mentioned the sheer staggering dumb fuckery of the Weeping Angel Statue of Liberty. If any one moment emphasizes how looking cool is more important to New Who than making so much as one fucking single lick of sense, this is it. This is off the scale retarded dumb fuckery. The city that never sleeps, yet the statue of fucking liberty can apparently wander across the fucking city without anyone glancing in it. No. Forget it. Enough. I don't see why I should put more thought into pointing out the unbelievable moronicity of this idea than Moffat did thinking it up. And that was it for series 7a. If series 6 had left me deflated and disappointed, this was the season where I started longing for deflated and disappointed. It's an awful mini-season, poorly thought out, shockingly badly executed, and just utter drivel from beginning to end. Sadly Series 7B would not be much of an improvement. To be continued.